Okay, guys, I started it. Hello, and welcome to another fresh general shadowing session. This session is with Dr. Robert Frey, and he will give a presentation, and if time permits, a Q&A afterwards. Perfect. So welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to get started over here. So just to give you guys a little background about uh, my journey of becoming a general dentist, um, I grew up in the Bay Area. I did my college at Pacific Union College, and then I did a year of um, for my master's afterwards. Then I got my um, dental degree in 2019, and I finished up my advanced education in general dentistry um, in 2020, so last year. So I'm relatively new to this game of dentistry, but um, but that's kind of like my little journey there. Um, some of the things, you know, people always ask, especially pre dance like, what did you do in college? Or, you know, um, what position did you hold in college? So these are some of the things that I did in college that kind of, I guess, uh, helped with my resume. Um, I did um, some biology lab TAing. I did it for the basic bio series. I did microbio, I did immunology, and then I did some cancer research as well. And I was part of the Asian Student Association. Um, and then I did some research at Stanford as well for the Epstein-Barr virus, and then some mission trips, um, medical mission trips to Cambodia. So that's kind of the things that I did in college. And then from there, um, I did my master's, and then I um, moved on and worked on towards my um, doctorate for dental school. And when I was in Loma Linda, um, I did a few other things. I was a student ambassador for the School of Dentistry. I was part of the diversity committee. And then I don't know if any of you guys have heard of ASDA. It's the American Student Dental Association. If you haven't heard of it, I think it's they have tons of great resources for pre-dents. Um, so I highly suggest you guys go on there, join it. You could join it as pre-dents. And be involved in it. So I highly encourage you to do that. I didn't do that. Um, and I think, you know, looking back, I wish I would have done that just to get some more information about dentistry and the application process and all that stuff. But, um, and plus, you get to connect with um, fellow dental students that are part of um, ASDA. Um, there was always a group of pre dents that I always interacted with um, as well. So if you haven't heard of it, join it. I highly recommend it. Um, but through ASA, which is part of the Student um, Dental Association, I was also part of the advocacy committee. I did some advocacy work in DC and Sacramento. Um, and then just for clinical side, I was just a, um, a pod leader for our clinic um, for my little group. And I was kind of like the interface between the students and the, um, the clinical staff for the clinical professors. So. Um, those are some of the things that I did in dental school. And then now this is kind of what are the things that I do now. Um, I'm part of a group of um, elite dentists called the Spire Dental. It's just a group of dentists. We have different um, offices in San Diego and in um, Colorado and Texas. We're part of this big network now, but before that I was part of New Image Dental, still part of it. Um, but we just, you know, we're just part of this group now called Aspire. Um, so work at Isabella in Coronado. Um, I'm part of the San Diego County Dental Society editorial board. Um, I do lecture at Loma Linda still um, on and off. Um, I was a past council member for the California Dental Association on the Judicial Council. Um, and then I'm a future CDA, which is a California Dental Association delegate. And these are some of my memberships that I do hold um, currently. So just to give you a little bit of idea of what Aspire Dental is, it's just a collection of like-minded dentists who share the same passion for providing clinical excellence and exceptional patient experience. We combine passionate professionals with cutting edge technology in a relaxed modern office, and we are proud to provide the highest level of care for our patients. So we have various locations in California, in Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and we are continuing to expand. And our little, um, I guess, phrase or motto that we like to go by is clinical ex it's where clinical excellence meets inspired hospitality. So that's kind of the dental practice that I currently work at and, um, and continue to grow with them. So these are the two offices, one of them over on the right hand side. I, I'm from San Diego, California. I don't know if, um, if you are 
couldn't tell, but um, one of the offices is kind of like in the middle of downtown, not in downtown, but a little bit on the outskirts. And then the other one, Isabella, is on Coronado Island. So this is the bridge that I get to drive tomorrow. Um, and I work there once a week. So this is just some of the offices. I'm just gonna show you guys some photos of our office. Um, and then this is Isabella. So a typical day um, for me is I am here by 645 if I'm at the um, Aspire office and we go through morning huddle, we discuss, you know, what patients are needed, what, what's going on with the patient, what are their needs, what's going on, and we discuss about the culture of the practice because that's really important. Um, and then from there, I see my first patient at seven. Um, we are very... Um, we don't double book. We are very, um, one of the things that I think we really stress upon is that one-on-one -on -one connection with our patients, really sit down with them, talk to them, get to know them, you know, have that relatedness with them. And that's something that um, I'm very fortunate to be part of. Um, I'm not spread thin over six different ops and, you know, seeing you know only 10 minutes here 10 minutes there I, I really want to spend time with my patients and get to know them and really get to see like what are their needs and meet them at where they are at and then um you know get them the help that they desire to have so this is just kind of a basic outline of the hours that i i don't work seven to six or you know those long hours but you know i, I come in and we have double shifts and it get complicated when it comes to that but those are the hours that we are open so what is general dentistry it's essentially, I like to say, I'm your family medicine practitioner. I tell patients that all the time. I am the guy that is kind of like overseeing the whole case. So I look at, you know, do I need to send you off to oral surgery? Do I need to send you off to do a root canal? Do I need to send you off to a periodontist for gum grafting? All these different things. I'm kind of like the, the, you know, family medicine practitioner kind of overseeing everything and restoratively I look at it. And then from there, I kind of delegate certain things to other specialists that may need our, you know, collaboration with. So, you know, the most important thing that I always say is, you know, your chief concern. What is your chief concern? You know, don't say chief complaint, but, you know, what is it that you really want? And patients come in all with different types of values and different types of concerns. So finding out that and then meeting where they're at and then creating a treatment plan based off of that in order to meet them where they're at and to get them the health that they want to achieve. So I'm part of three different dentists. I have um, Dr. Scott on the right of me, Dr. Leslie on the left of me, and we're three dentists that kind of rotate between the two offices. So some of the procedures that we perform are restorative dentistry, so crowns, fillings, bridges, um, full mouth rehabs as well, um, veneers, cosmetic work, we do that too. Um, we do implants as well, implant placement, restoration, oral surgeries, extractions, bone grafting, um, I do some orthodontics as well, Invisalign, Dr. Leslie and I do that. And then we do some removable and fixed pros, which is, you know, some of the major all on four, all on six, all these big cases of, you know, rehabbing a patient, some periodontal surgery as well. So these are some of the things that we perform just to we kind of dip our fingers in various different things. And if we can't do it, or we don't think, you know, we don't, can't achieve the, the, the result that we think we could get, then we send them off to a specialist and they are much more versed in those things. So we have to call ourselves a modern dental practice. And what does that mean? So I like to, you know, I love technology and dentistry is all about technology and it's always evolving. So some of the things that we'll talk about is some of the technology that we have in this practice. And I hope this kind of gets you excited as to what dentistry can offer, but um, electric hand pieces, that's something that is kind of standard now-ish, but um, that's always kind of exciting to use. Um, salivary diagnostics is kind of something that's on the cutting edge. We use salivary diagnostics to, you know, figure out what kind of biofilm that you may have in your mouth in order to figure out what your cavity risks are, what your periodontal risks are in order to developing periodontal disease. You know, this is, it's really coming to me now with salivary diagnostics, we're able to do COVID testing with them too. We don't do them at our practices, but we're able to have that option. Um, so it's really, this is kind of an emerging field and in order to really get to know what the patient's risks are and trying to lower their risks. That's really what we're here for. We're trying to figure out, are they high, medium, or moderate to low risk on various things? And then from there, what can we do in order to shift that risk from, 
let's say really high to low, right? All these different um, treatment options. Um, we do some lab work here too. So we have InLab, which is a, a lab tech software. Um, everything that we do here is um, digital. We rarely do anything that's analog. So it's a lot of digital work. Um, so we do this in-lab software to design crowns, full restorations, veneers, all these different things. We also have the iTero 5D. This is also um, another scanner that we use in order to um, do some of our Invisalign cases. Also now with the iTero 5D has what we call NERI technology, which is uh, near infrared technology that's able to detect cavities in between your teeth without having to take radiographs. So we still take radiographs, but we're able to use this as an adjunctive component to figure out and diagnose cavities before they get any bigger. So it's kind of a cool tool to have. Um, and we use that for a lot of our Invisalign because Invisalign and Itero have a partnership and we use that to kind of um, show patients where they're tracking and their Invisalign process. We do 3D printing here as well. Um, surgical guides, mouth guards, uh, models, we print them all, wash them, all these. So this is a whole sprint ray um, series. And then we also have a thing called Airflow One, which is kind of uh, very few practices do have this, where I would say one out of, I would say five practices within the San Diego area that have this technology. Um, I don't know if many of you, I'm pretty sure majority of you guys know the ultrasonic, the high pitch noise when you get your cleanings done to break things apart. And then from there, you know, they use that polishing paste to polish your teeth. We don't do that here. Um, there's just a lot of research out there that shows that the polishing paste does kind of ruin the, the enamel, the hard part of your teeth and kind of takes it away. So we use something a little bit different, Airflow One. It kind of helps clean it out. It's called biofilm. Um, Essentially, we disclose your mouth, we find out where all the biofilm, all the yucky, gunky stuff are, and then we blow um, the airflow, which has some sugar powders in it to kind of kill the bacteria, but also kind of clean everything out. So this is a video. Let's see if it works. On the airflow one. is this faster it actually cleans the teeth better and it's able to go into that gum pocket too and kind of clean all that bacteria out it's great for implants um deep pockets as well so it's um yeah it's called guided biofilm therapy that's what it is gbt so um, that's kind of a technology that we offer and then we have the galileos which is our 3d um, ct scanner that we do all of our implant planning on we're able to see everything in 3d um, which is great because you know see the joints we can see the teeth we can see make sure the root canals are looking good we can see where the nerve is we can see you know it's a it's, it's a great tool to have when we um, plan major cases and of course digital radiographs um, we have that as well so today i kind of want to talk to you i know we've been kind of jumping around here and there but i kind of wanted to talk about a little bit about the process of making a crown so um, crowns are kind of the bread and butter of dentistry, and um, I don't know if you guys are aware of what the process is, but this is kind of the process how it used to be or how, you know, certain offices still do this. So, for example, if you had to get a dental crown, you, the dentist will number your tooth, we'll take a preliminary impression and the shade of the tooth, so we'll take, you know, we'll use that goopy stuff to get impression, then we kind of remove all that tooth material, filling, decay, whatever it may be. Then we go in and we take another impression of it. We send it out to the lab. 
It takes about two weeks for the lab to create the crown. And then from there, we get it back into our office and we cement it. So it's about a two week process from start to finish, um, you know, when you're making a crown. Well, here we do it one day within two hours. So we have a thing called the prime scan. It scans your mouth, gets, gets a 3D scan of your whole mouth. And then from there, we're able to design the crown and also make the crown within the same day. So this is called the prime mill. So we have the prime scan, which is the scanning part of it. So we scan, get your impression, get everything done. This computer will generate and create the crown for you. We adjust it accordingly based off of certain parameters. And then we send this data off to the prime mill. So this is the prime mill. I'll show you a little video about with of the prime mill. Prime Mill, um, you know, there's various materials that we use. We use everything from lithium disilicate to zirconia, and there's different brands and different things, but um, certain crowns we can make within, we can mill it out within four minutes. Certain ones take about 12 minutes to mill. And then from there, I'm not showing you this part, but it goes into an oven and then it gets baked and cooked and glazed and all that. And then we deliver it to the patient. So, you know, going from a two week time period to now two hours, it's good for the patient, it's good for the practice. And overall, it's just a great experience. So that's something that we offer to all of our patients whenever they need a crown. Um, it's done very, very um, conveniently for them. That's just kind of how it is, right? You have a broken tooth, we prep the tooth, and then from there, you know, we create the restoration and then in two hours you get your crown. So what we do at our practices is we try to leverage technology to provide a quality care for our patients. So that's really what we want is, you know, there's so much technology out there, but we wanna make sure that it's, you know, providing quality to our patients as well. So that's just a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we do here. I kind of wanted to kind of gear the gear this towards pre-dents because yes, dentistry is exciting, but also you need to get into dental school, right? Before you can even do any of this stuff. So let's don't put the cart before the horse. Let's talk about some of the things that, you know, pre-dents that I think you guys should be aware of um, prior to even applying or prior to even going into dental school. So some of these are some of the tips and tricks, right? So some of the things that I will 
tell you guys right now, especially if you guys are thinking about going to dental school, is make sure you love dentistry, okay? Like, shadow as much as you can, get to know about as much as you can, because you're going to be doing this, as I said on the slide, for the rest of your life. It is an investment. It's an extremely large investment. You know, right now, I just saw something that NYU is probably going to be projected somewhere around, somewhere around $750,000. That's for four years of dental school. That's excluding the interest that comes with it throughout the four years. And this is the thing that as pre dents you know, I want you to guys be aware of because this is not a drop in the bucket. Like really think about it because if you aren't really in love with this profession, don't go, you know, into it. There's a lot of debate out there right now as to is it worth even going to dentistry right now? Because it's actually a very saturated market. There's actually tons of dentists out there now. You know, is it even a good field to go into um, just based off of the saturation of the market and, you know, of course, there's insurance that gets involved at times too, but also just the cost of dental school too. I mean, and this is the highest it's ever been, I believe. So, you know, really think about it. Um, of course, do it because you love it, not because you're going to make a lot of money. That's really what, that's really the key thing. Like dentistry is a great field to go into, but I don't want you to think of, oh, I'm going to be making tons of money doing it. Like it's not, that's not the reality of it. Like do it because you really want to help people and doing the right thing, right? Um, I think through COVID, I've seen a lot of things where make sure you prepare to do residency in order to be competitive. Like people graduating straight from dental school, like I don't think it's, they're starting to get less and less experience as you're going to school. So it's funny because the cost of schooling is going up, but the level of experience you're getting is actually less and COVID has changed that completely. So, you know, be, be prepared to do some sort of residency, whether it be like an AG or GPR for planning to do general, or you're going to go specialize into something just so that you are, you, you have more experience underneath your belt. Um, because remember, dental school really only teaches you the basics. It's really the basics of it. And you have to remember that dentistry and, and any medical profession continually changes. So you're going to have to be you know, a lifelong learner, like you have to love that. And that's something that I absolutely love about dentistry because it's always evolving and always changing. So, you know, learn to love now. No, learn to learn to love to learn now. That's what I meant. <laughs> um, and then diversify your experience in college, right? Because dentistry is a people profession. So, you know, get to know how to strike conversations with random people, learn how to learn about different cultures, go travel. Like, I mean, COVID has changed that a little bit, but like put yourself out there because, you know, you have to learn to be a people person and get related with your patient because that's really what it all comes down to. And then, as I said before, get involved with ASDA, the American Student Dental Association early. I think it's very beneficial for you to learn and, you know, learn from them and, you know, tips and tricks and stuff from them. Um, so right now, this is something that I just pulled out today, the total pre-doctoral enrollment right now. So this is something that is currently what the amount of dental students that are currently, you know, enrolled in dental school is 25,995 25, students. That's the highest level it's ever been. So there's a lot of students and the dental schools are pumping dentists out. And according to the survey of dental practices, the average net income for dentists in private practice in 2020 was 170,160. So compare the $750,000, you know, like I'll be honest, my student loan debt is like around 600,000. And, you know, so that's, you know, if you look at that number and that, like it's, you have to really look at it, right? And then the United States Bureau of Labor and Statistics stated it was even lower, it was 156. So, and then for specialists, of course, it's higher, but then their loan average is closer to a million. So, you know, really look at this and really see, like, is this something that I could really want to do for the rest of my life? And then, you know, the average dental school debt is about $304,824. So that's for general dentists and then of course higher for specialists. So, you know, I'm not trying to discourage everybody or discourage you to go into this field, but like know what you're going into, you know, I want you to be well informed. And if you decide to go it, 
perfect. But I would hate for someone to go into this thinking, oh, mom pressured me or dad pressured me to go into this or, oh, I need to do it because of X, Y, and Z. Like, I want this to be something that you want to do because this is what you're, this is the reality that you're going to be living with for the rest of your life. Um, of course, COVID has changed a lot of it, right? So, you know, um, the future of the dental profession was questionable at the beginning of COVID. I think now we kind of know where we kind of fit in. Um, the next couple of years could be hard to navigate. This is this slide I made at the beginning of COVID. I think now it's kind of changed and I think we have kind of have a better idea of where we're heading. Um, of course, adopting new practices, um, now with the Delta variant coming out, you know, nothing has really changed, at least in California per se, you still have to wear masks and all that stuff. But, you know, that's where practice management and optimizing patient encounters and reassuring patients that it is safe to go to the dental office. You know, a lot of people were worried that, you know, I might get COVID from going to the dental office. There's actually dental, dental offices are actually the safest place to be because of our personal protection equipment, our sterilization, our sanitation, all that stuff that we put into place long prior to COVID. It just shows that what we've been doing is actually, um, you know, safe for patients. And then on this chart here, it just talks about the occupational risk, right? So, you know, just based off of the annual income where dentists are and, you know, the, the occupational risk, I mean, dentists are the highest when it comes to, well, I wouldn't say the highest, but we're pretty high up there um, in regards to occupational risk based off of COVID and aerosols and all that stuff. But interesting enough, we are still the safest place to be. So this is something that I pulled up recently. This is the 2020 data. So this kind of gives you an average of what um, DATs you should be shooting for. I thought it was very interesting looking back at, you know, how it's kind of climbed up as time has gone. So um, not to put any pressure, but this is kind of the average DAT scores that dental schools are accepting all across the board now. So um, of course every school varies, but I thought this was something that might be relevant to you guys. Um, so that you guys are kind of aware of what schools are looking for. And for dental school applications, of course, you know, be strategic, like look at the cost of the school, look at the tuition, look at the cost of the living area in the air, you know, where the school is located, because you're going to be responsible if you're taking out federal loans, you're going to be responsible for that at the end of the day. So really look at that, like take that into consideration when you're applying and kind of weigh things out. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't matter if you go to Harvard you know, it doesn't matter if you go to Loma Linda, it doesn't matter if you go to UCLA, at the end of the day, you are, you graduate with a DDS or a DMD, you're still a dentist. So, you know, maybe, you know, people may disagree with me on that, but, you know, I think it's, I've seen people do it smart where they just say, I'm just going to go to the cheapest school, get the training, you know, that I need to get. And then from there, you know, at least my loan burden is, isn't as high. So, you know, be, be strategic when you do this. Um, you know, talk to alumni that went to that school if you're interested in going to UCLA, UC, you know, SF or you know, Loma Linda. Like, talk to talk to alumni because they'll give you kind of the experience that they had. Um, you know, I would say my experience back in 2019 is very different compared to the 2020 class. So, you know, you, the 2020 class may have a better idea as to what the school feels now compared to where it was when I was there. So talk to more recent grads might be better, but, um, and then, you know, cast a wide net, don't limit yourself, but cast a wide net of schools that you're going to apply to and start your application early, right? Because there's a lot of things that you have to get in there and prepare for. So the earlier you start, as soon as, I don't know, I think it's called ad sounds, right? Whenever that's open, um, just start putting it in there and start inputting all that information, starting your personal statement and stuff. And then, you know, with COVID-19, things have changed for sure, but, you know, be creative. You know, you guys are right now, I that check, right? Virtual shadowing, you doing that, right? Get involved with ASDA. You know, with COVID, you had to think out of the box. This is something that, you know, this virtual shadowing was never a thing with when I was going through dental school or prior to dental school, this was never a thing, but, you know, you guys have learned to adapt. Um, make connections via LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, of course, seek mentorship early. I think having mentors is so important. They kind of shape you and they teach you things that you may have not thought of. So find a mentor that you can talk to about, you know, whatever it may be, um, just so that you have some guidance. Um, 
learn other cultures, right? Uh, learn from other people. That's something that I think is very important because we are in a people profession, right? Um, and if collaborate, right? I think all this other stuff, don't reinvent the wheel, copy genius, learn to ask for help and welcome help, collaborate, don't compete. Like this is a stressful environment. I know college can be very competitive at times, but you know, this is, you want to collaborate, learn from each other. You know, if other people have good ideas, kind of copy that. Um, you know, and just kind of go with us. Remember, you know, collaborate, don't compete. That's a very important thing. And dental school, same thing. As soon as you get into dental school, remember, collaborate, don't compete. So these are some of the personal questions that I kind of throw out there to kind of make you think of like, is this the field that I can go into? You know, like, why do I want to be a dentist? You know, is it because of status? Is it because of finance? Is it parental pressure? Or because my friends are doing it or want to fit in? Or is it because I want to, I'm following my, you know, my parents' footsteps, whatever it may be, right? Know your why. Um, you know, am I good with my hands? So have good eye, hand eye coordination. That's very important because that's something that we do all day, every day. Am I going to be okay with having a large amount of debt for the rest, you know, for, rest of my life or you know there's different strategies of course but am I going to be okay with having that like mentally um would I be burned out from being in school too long right like dental school is another four years after college so am I going to be okay with doing another four years um am I be am I intimidated by the idea of being surrounded by other classmates that are just as or more qualified than I am in dental school like when you go to dental school I'll tell you this in college you know you're all competing to get in as soon as you're in dental school it's a playing field is flat. Like everybody is there, same level as you or even better. So am I gonna be intimidated? Am I gonna be okay with that, right? Um, can I see myself working in people's mouths every day? Like you're gonna be working in people that have gag reflexes. I have patients that are gag reflexes or you know, patients that have tiny little mouths. Am I gonna be okay with doing that every single day? Can I deal with difficult patients? You know, it's a people profession. So. You know, some people are gonna love you, some people are not gonna love you. Am I gonna be okay with that? Um, am I passionate? Am I empathetic? Am I connected with people? Um, am I gonna continue to learn? Am I gonna be okay with continuing to learn for the rest of my life? Because, you know, for me, as soon as I graduated, I'm still putting a lot of money in CE courses. Like, that's just the part of growing as a practitioner and being better at my craft. So, you know, I put, you know, a good chunk of money, you know, towards CEs for the first year out of dental, first year out of residency. Like I put a good chunk of money in there, you know, just so that I could be, you know, cutting edge or being, you know, proficient at my craft. Um, and then, you know, for me, this is another, like, I guess, very philosophical question. If I didn't get paid to do it, would I still do it, right? You know, can I see myself doing this if I didn't get paid? You know, of course, getting paid for your craft is important, but is this a passion of yours? Do you love doing what you're doing? Um, so I just kind of throw in there um, because I know for me, if I didn't get paid to do it, I would still do it because I love this field. It's, it's just so like amazing and it's, it's, it's fun. I love it. Um, this is my contact information. This is my email. That's my Instagram. You guys are more than always welcome to contact me, email me, shoot me an IG message. I respond as quickly as I can. Um, you know, throw out questions if you guys have. Um, I even review personal statements if, you know, like all that stuff. Like I'm here for you guys. I know college can be very um, stressful and even navigating the whole, like, where am I gonna be in life? And, um, you know, where, what kind of career am I going towards? Like, you're more than always, you're, you guys are always welcome to reach out. So I just wanted to put that out there for you guys, okay? Um, and that is it for me. Um, I guess now it would be kind of question and answer time if anybody has question and answers. Uh, thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. It was really informative. Uh, the first question I actually have is uh, regarding uh, airflow, that airflow technology you mentioned. And uh, just considering like in all dentistry um, on like how that if, if uh, I just want like elaboration on how that affects like pa uh, patient response and like improvement for like wait times, uh, like, and that, that just general setting, if you could elaborate more on that, because that sounds really interesting. Like wait times as in like how long patients wait? 
Yeah, because uh, I actually shadow, uh, uh, like, I've done tons of shadowing, and I uh, also work at a general dentist, and I notice right. a lot of crowns, uh, like, when, when he does temporaries, uh, they often cause, di uh, like, discomfort, sometimes the bite isn't right, you know, uh, right. sometimes it's, like, a little loose, uh, like, I just want your perspective on how uh, that technology is, in its sense, worth it, and improves upon that, like, kind We're of negative about prime, aspect. We're talking about Prime Scan. Okay. Prime Scan. Yeah. Okay, yes. Oh. So, no temps. I don't deal with temps. Um, in and out, two hours. Patients come in, I numb them up, I scan them, I do my prep. They sit in the chair, they go on their phone, go on Facebook, whatever they want to do. Um, and two, an hour and a half later, the crown's ready to go. I cement them and they're off in their merry way. So, you know, it, it's a big investment, mind you, right? This technology is not cheap. It's a big investment. So, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I work in a practice that has, you know, saw the benefit of that investment and went forward with it. But, you know, it is a very costly, you know, investment and you kind of have to justify, is it worth doing, you know, going that direction or not? Um, but I mean, patients love it. We get patients from all over, you know, San Diego asking, oh, I can get my crown done in one day. Oh yeah, I'm coming to you guys. You know, like it's, it's that convenience factor of, you know, temps break, temps pop off, temps are uncomfortable, you know, whatever it may be, you know, so I don't, we don't deal with that. So um, I think it's just more convenience and um, I guess overall, you know, um, patient satisfaction. Oh, wow. Uh, like uh, when you mentioned that like patients have actually come just to like, just to your office, just for that uh, aspect, that actually sounds like really interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, my second question is like uh, kind of an expansion on like the aspect of the technology and dentistry and how uh, like a lot of these technologies offer like uh, as you said like amazing benefits like two, uh, like two week wait times are essentially eliminated uh, for like new practices uh, uh, opening up would you say like this technology is like worth the investment and like how expensive is this type of uh, equipment like compared to just like you know, standard dentistry. Like I know you even mentioned like electrical hand pieces. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's go hand pieces, right? Like, you know, electric hand pieces. I work on both. I've had a turbine hand pieces and electric hand pieces, turbine hand pieces don't have enough torque. You're pushing, you have to push a lot harder on, on the tooth in order to cut it. You know, it's just, some people do great with them. Right. I electric hand pieces. I just push on it. It has a certain amount of torque. I could control the torque. I could control the speed. Everything's electronic cut smoother in my hands. Um, so cost wise, electric hand pieces are a lot more costly. I would, you know, I can't give you a fair number of how much it is per se, but you know, one single hand piece for me, excluding the electric motor is about, I think what, 1300 plus the motor itself is another 13, 1500. So that one piece itself is, you know, 3000. And then plus the unit needs to be connected to is another 3000. Like it, it adds up, right? Compared to air driven, it's just the hand piece and everything's just air, right? So it's, it's a little bit different. Um, crowns, right? The prime scan, prime mill and the, you know, the furnace, um, gosh, I think it probably runs close to 300 K something right there. I didn't buy it. I don't know what the price is, but it, I've heard it runs around that price. So, you know, you have to kind of justify is it worth going that direction or not? You know, every practice is different. Um, you have overhead, you have employee costs, right? You have the practice loan. Like there's a lot of things that come into play. Like, you know, you, some, you just can't just throw money, $300,000 that easily. Right. So it's, it's, um, especially if you're, you know, you're opening up your new practice, like it's a whole nother game there. So, um, but there, there may come a point where you're like, well, it might be more beneficial for me to go with the prime scan, prime mill, and the oven, 
just because of the volume of crowns that I do already with my patients. And, you know, I see the benefit for my patients, right? So it's this kind of like weighing out that practitioners have to make. Uh, another question I have is, what would you say to a pre-dental student who uh, is really passionate about dentistry, uh, but is a little scared off like the cost of uh, pre-dental uh, of dental school? Because you know, like maybe like the number like four hundred, five hundred thousand doesn't really reach like our heads. Like we don't really process how much that may be, and uh, with like scares of like saturation and now uh, uh, and like residencies. Uh, like what advice or what guidance would you give to students who may be a little offset or maybe just a little cautious of like that new trend of like rising costs and like, et cetera. I think just know that you want to do it, right? Like I'm not here to scare people off of the profession. I think the profession is, I love it. It's a great profession to be in, but you know, I don't want, people to go in thinking one thing and coming out disappointed right and you know student loans there's so many different ways of tackling that right but also at the same time it's like being smart about it you know i went in you know thinking this is kind of foolish of me of like i didn't know what my loan balance was going to be at the end you know i thought oh it'll be fine and now looking at it i'm like okay i make x amount of money this is my loan amount like you know, it is daunting, but it isn't impossible, right? But at the same time, that's something that you kind of have to weigh out. Um, but, you know, I think in any career, I don't think it's only dentistry, I think it's in medicine, I think it's in engineering, I think it's in any type of occupation that you're planning to go into and invest time, right? Money is one thing. And I think money, you know, we could get money and we could lose money, but money, it, it, you, could, you could always get money somehow, some way. Time is something that you can never get back. So for me, it's just really making sure that you are doing something that you absolutely love and you have a passion for, and you are willing to go to the ninth mile for and invest all this time and energy in, you know, and if you can say yes to that, then go for it. I think that's, I don't think there's a monetary value as to, you know, when at this point you shouldn't be doing it. Like, you know, I think if you have the passion for it, go for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, like, another question I have is about, uh, like, you know, the, uh, as you mentioned, there's, like, a lot of uh, new technologies that are being developed. Uh, how does that, like, play into, uh, like, learning, like, the, like, are you, using these new technologies, like, difficult or easy? Like, is it, it's, like, not foreign, but it's, like, easy to learn, uh, like, for a well, new dentist trying to learn? Yeah, so some schools are adopting it, right? So I had some exposure to CAD CAM, which is the primes, not the prime scan series, but the previous versions. I had some exposure to that. So the schools are adapting to it. Like, you know, now the school, you know, Loma Linda is now doing, you know, 3D scans, doing this. So they're, they are adopting to it. Um, so the learning curve may not be too high, but still, I mean, I am still, I've used, the prime scan for a year now and i'm still learning how to use it and there are ce's that i need to take to learn how to use it better so it's always that constant improvement you know like oh this case didn't work or this crown broke okay how could i improve better right so it's this constant journey of like you know improvement um so you know I think, it, I mean, that's in any technology, any type of, remember, dentist, dental school only teaches you basics, right? It's just really, really basics, like scratching the surface. And then you go into CE courses, you take other courses out there and you're like, oh, wow. It opens your eyes up a little bit more. So, um, so that's why I'm saying like, it's a constant learning, like you're, you're learning for the rest of your life. And there's going to be a lot of monetary investment and time investment in that as well. So you have to be okay with that, right? Um, because if not, you're just stagnant, you're not growing as a clinician and you can't offer the best for your patients. Uh, yeah, honestly, my dentist, uh, like that eyeshadow uh, and work with, uh, t tells me the same thing that he's constantly, uh, learning new things and like new technologies are developed like 20 years ago. He wasn't the same dentist as he is now. So that's honestly something I like love to hear. Cause I feel like that just makes like the profession more exciting.
you know? Yeah. Well, I, I like to say it's it's called the practice of dentistry, right? It's practicing. You are there every day practicing and, 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 and like improving yourself, improving the patient experience, improving, you know, clinical out, outcomes. It's, it's it, you know, even medicine, same thing, practice of medicine, right? We're practitioners at the end of the day. So, yeah, I mean, I imagine, I hope, you know, when starting, like looking now and 20 years now, like I hope I'm not the same clinician I am today. Like I hope by 20 years I am, I know my stuff. I know how to do it. Like I, you know, I've grown, right. But it's that continual yeah. growth and getting uncomfortable. And that whole thing is, you know, that's the process of, you know, being a clinician. And then, uh, so just to elaborate. So, uh, like for these new technologies, uh, do you have to be certified in a certain course? Do you, uh, go to like the companies like training, uh, how does like, uh, one learn how to operate those uh, machines? Right. So you would go to, you know, if you're learning how to use the prime scan or the prime mill, you're going and you'll learn from the company themselves or they have a trainer that comes out and trains you on how to use the system. Um, you take CE courses on how to use the airflow, you know, verbiage on the airflow, you know, all these different technologies, they all have CEs attached to them and, you know, using them, you know, and then, you know, learning from, different practitioners out there that have the same technology too, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so yeah, there is that, there is that, um, you're using their, the company's, you know, system per se. Yeah. You don't need certifications. Um, certain things you may need, you know, you do need certifications for, for example, like oral conscious sedation that we do here. If I need to, you know, sedate somebody with meds, yes, I need to have an oral conscious sedation license from the state of California. Um, you know, if I'm doing some laser, there's some laser certification out there. So yeah, there are certain, you know, certain things that are required by the state that you need to do in order to do them. But um, otherwise, you know, other than, other than that, it's just learning, you know, the company on how to use them oh so there's like not too much like you know trouble or like i don't know uh bureaucracy uh, in it like it's more of just uh, the actual learning experience and just yourself being confident in uh operation of the machine yeah i mean there's i mean it's not like the, the state of california is saying oh you don't know how to use the CEREC machine and you know your license is revoked like I have a license to practice dentistry, <laughs> yeah. right? I don't need a certificate on how to use a CEREC system, but I have, you know, I've gone through some training on how to use it proficiently to provide quality care, you know, that type of thing. Uh, oh, uh, well, that's my last question. Uh, I'm honestly out of questions, uh, uh, but I'd lo really like to thank you for your time, input, and most uh, importantly, your perspective. I really feel like it was really informative. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, of course.